House of the Dragon is an HBO TV series set in the universe of George R. R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire. It follows the story of the Targaryen dynasty, some 200 years before the events of Game of Thrones. While watching season 1 of this show, I noticed a strong resemblance between a character of Daemon Targaryen and the Byzantine Emperor Andronicus Komnenos. The similarities I caught initially were pretty mild, so it could have easily been a coincidence. Both were arrogant and ruthless, both eloped with their nieces, and both were continuously forgiven by their liege because of being a relative and a childhood friend. So I went back to primary sources to check my theory. After reading more on the reign of Manuel Komnenos, I'm now absolutely convinced that either George Martin and show creators were heavily inspired by those events, or this is the biggest coincidence in historical fiction. I'm going to present my argument and let you decide which one it is. Before we begin, I should warn you that there are going to be massive spoilers for House of the Dragon Season 1. I'm also going to use the events in the series as quote-unquote canon, even though they sometimes aren't the same as in the book on which the show is based. There have been multiple retcons of the story, so the best we can do right now is to treat the last version as the one that is true. To show the parallels between the historical and fictional story, I'm going to present their characters side by side and tell you how their actions and motives align. House of the Dragon starts with a disputed succession. The old king Jaehaerys has no living son, so the lords of the realm deliberate on who should inherit the throne. They decide on the eldest male descendant, instead of the eldest overall claimant, who is a woman, Princess Rhaenys. The decision is made, but not everyone is satisfied. Some still think that the other candidate was more worthy. This is reminiscent of the ascension of Manuel Komnenos. Manuel had an older brother Isaac, who may have been viewed as a more legitimate successor to their father, John Komnenos. But the army acclaimed Manuel, and the dying Emperor John confirmed their decision. Still, some people would prefer Isaac and were left unsatisfied. King Viserys and Emperor Manuel are both preoccupied with three main things – diplomacy, succession and prophecy. These three things are intertwined. Viserys and Manuel want to keep the realm stable after their death. This means making sure that the subjects are loyal, the neighboring countries are friendly and their family members are on good terms with each other. Both dedicate a lot of time and energy to those goals, and both ultimately fail. Prophecies play a big role in both Viserys' and Manuel's political decisions. Viserys is driven by the dream of Aegon the Conqueror. Aegon foresaw the coming of a terrible winter that will threaten the world of the living. If humanity is to survive, the realm needs to be united with a capable Targaryen ruler at its helm. Manuel had a similar premonition. As he lay sleeping, he saw himself in a dream, boarding a flagship together with many of his close friends, with whom he sailed into the Propontis. Suddenly, the mountains of Europe and Asia appeared to collapse, and everything in the shattered vessel was lost, while he was barely able to swim to dry land. Manuel took this dream as a premonition of a coming catastrophe. Another source says that during the Second Crusade, he had a dream that prophesied the sack of Constantinople by the Latins. Finally, there was another popular prophecy going around during his reign. An oracle was asked, how long shall the dynasty of Alexios Komnenos reign? And his answer was, Ema, the Greek word for blood. This one was easy to interpret. The first three Komnenian emperors were Alexios, Ioannes and Manuel. The first letters of those names in Greek were Alpha, Iota and Mu, three out of four letters in the word Ema. This meant that Manuel's successor should be someone whose name starts with an alpha. Our chronicler Nikitas Honiatis writes that the members of the Komnenoi family put a lot of credit into this prophecy, especially Manuel, for whom it was a confirmation of legitimacy over his brother Isaac. Manuel's first marriage, just like that of Viserys, did not produce a male heir. His first wife, Bertha of Salzbach, died in 1159, leaving him with a single daughter. Manuel was described as roaring like a lion in grief at her death, even though he was known to have been sleeping around during their marriage. Manuel, same as Viserys, decided on a very bold move to secure the succession. He did not, however, appoint his daughter Maria to succeed him. Instead, he betrothed her to the prince Bella of Hungary, 
and made him his heir apparent. Bella was a younger brother of King Stephen of Hungary. This marriage would have created a strong alliance between the Empire and its western neighbor that would serve as a bulwark against any possible aggression coming from for the west. But what about the Ama prophecy? Bella certainly doesn't start with the letter A. Well, you see, one of the conditions for Bella's elevation was that he would change his name to Alexios. The prophecy would be satisfied, and both alliance and succession would be secured. In a ceremony much similar to Rhaenyra's elevation in the end of the show's first episode, Roman dignitaries and members of the imperial family pledged allegiance to the future emperor Alexios. Appointing a Hungarian prince as the heir to the empire was as controversial as appointing a girl to inherit the Seven Kingdoms. He wasn't a woman, but he was a foreigner, and his elevation would have been opposed by every ambitious male relative of the Komnenoi line. On top of that, Bella's brother Stephen died in 1172 without a surviving son. Had Bella still been an heir to the Byzantine throne as well, it may have resulted in a personal union between two powerful realms, and history could have turned out very differently. However, three years before Stephen's death, Manuel's second marriage produced a son. The betrothal between Bella Alexios and Maria was broken, and Bella went back to being just a Hungarian prince. He was awarded an honorary title Caesar, but it was probably a small consolation. Unsurprisingly, Manuel's first true-born son was named Alexios. While I was reading Honiatis, I got a little bit confused at this point. For some reason, I thought that Manuel actually adopted Bella as his son. So when another son was born to Manuel and he named him Alexios, it reminded me of the reveal in Game of Thrones that Jon Snow's father was Rhaegar Targaryen and his real name is Aegon, despite Rhaegar already having a son called Aegon from his first marriage. Back then, I thought that it was just show writers being dumb, because I couldn't imagine any sane person giving his two different sons the same name. But when you get deep enough into Byzantine history and read about those periods where dozens of characters share three or four names, you start to think that the writers might have been onto something. It may not have been as egregious as in those shows, but the similarity is still there. Targaryens are obsessed with the name Aegon because of the prophecy of the prince that was promised, and the members of the Komnenoi dynasty were obsessing over names because of the Aemer prophecy. When you think about it, the prophecy isn't even that impressive. Most male nobles of the 12th century Byzantium had a name that started with an Alpha, Iota or Mu. It was either Alexios, Andronicus, Isaac, Ioannis, Manuel or Michael. There is an occasional Nikiforos, Nikitas or Constantinos, but in the Komnenian era, these were much less common. In fact, from Alexios Komnenos to the fall of Constantinople, every emperor except three has a name that starts with one of those letters. The exceptions are two Theodorus Lascarides, who ruled the Empire of Nicaea, and the very last emperor, Constantine XI. So this prophecy is very self-fulfilling, but it did not prevent Eastern Roman noblemen from believing in it. And one of those who believed in it as strongly as the emperor himself was Manuel's cousin, Andronicus. His resemblance to Daemon Targaryen from the show is the reason I started making this video. It is just so uncanny, to the point that I actually went back to thinking that it is coincidental. I can't imagine George R. R. Martin read a paragraph about how Andronicus had a rivalry with his one-eyed nephew, copied it into his book, and just hoped that no one would notice. We don't know too much about the youth of Andronicus and Manuel, but what can be said for certain is that both pairs of siblings used to be very close. In the show we are given a scene in which Viserys and Daemon reminisce about their childhood. And in his history, Honiatis mentions how Andronicus always stood up for Manuel whenever he thought that some nobleman showed disrespect to his cousin. These friendships are the reason that later in life, neither Viserys nor Manuel were able to adequately and decisively deal with their respective sibling. And boy was there a lot to deal with. Daemon and Andronicus strike dashing figures. Both are described as having arrogant and magnetic personalities. Andronicus is even said to have had a physique worthy of the Empire. Daemon rides a dragon and wields a conqueror's sword, while Andronicus had a special aura about him because of the Aemer prophecy. To be fair to Daemon, his sedition against his brother doesn't really reach the level of Andronicus's transgressions. The show character always goes rogue and acts rebelliously, but his redeeming quality is supposed to be the fact that he wouldn't think about harming his brother. 
Andronicus just straight up plots to murder Manuel. And considering this, it is even more jarring that the Emperor's cousin always receives forgiveness from his ruler. Be it when he plots sedition, elopes with his niece, or goes on some unapproved reckless military campaign. Andronicus and Daemon just have to appear penitent for a little bit, and their leech lord would believe that they have changed, scold them mildly, and send them to govern their provinces like a good dutiful cousin or brother should. Manuel always sends Andronicus to Cilicia, while Viserys tells Daemon to go back to his wife in the Vale. Of course, the actual governing is too boring for them, and after a short while both Daemon and Andronicus go on some other wild escapade that is sure to get them in trouble. This is a part where history becomes less believable than fantasy. At least with Daemon we understand that his dragon works like a get-out-of-jail-free card. Andronicus just had to rely on his charisma. After reading about his exploits, I wouldn't be surprised if he actually did have a dragon, because his ability to keep his head after seducing every noble woman east of Italy sounds less realistic than a fire-breathing reptilian monster. The only time when Andronicus and Daemon appear to be somewhat tamed is when they run off to the east with one of their much younger nieces. Daemon actually marries his niece Lena, and their age difference is about 20 years. Andronicus simply eloped with his niece Theodora to the court of Nur ad-Din in Damascus. When this happened, Andronicus was well into his fifties, but his charms seemed to not have been affected by age, seeing how they worked on a 17-year-old Theodora. The two characters have already been involved with a pair of their nieces, Rhaenyra and Eudokia respectively, but this new relationship looks very different. Instead of being their usual hit it and quit it personas, both Andronicus and Daemon become family men and balance it with a life of mild adventuring in the East, away from the court intrigue of the capital. They seemingly want to keep it that way, but fate intervenes. Lena dies, while her historical counterpart Theodora is kidnapped and brought to Constantinople together with her children. These events pull Daemon and Andronicus back into the politics of the realm, with some disastrous consequences in the end. There are a whole slew of similarities in the details of character descriptions. Rumors of conspiracy circulate around Daemon, while Andronicus, of course, was involved in an actual conspiracy. The murder plot's aftermath was probably the only time when Manuel was strict towards Andronicus. He imprisoned him in a dungeon, but being a very resourceful man, Andronicus devised a plan straight out of Shawshank Redemption and escaped to his relatives in Rus. There he assembled a host and marched it in support of Manuel in his war against Hungary. With this he earned his cousin's forgiveness, and they supposedly hugged it out. This parallels the war in the Stepstones in the House of the Dragon, in which Daemon earns back his brother's favor by dedicating a victory to him and pledging undying loyalty. So we saw how Daemon and Andronicus almost became family men. Maybe they can mend their ways and exercise restraint. Maybe the responsibility of leadership would have made them less impulsive. Can a character like Daemon Targaryen be a good ruler? Does Andronicus' story provide an example of that? No, not at all. Andronicus was one of the worst emperors imaginable. When Manuel died and left his 11-year-old son Alexios the sole emperor, Andronicus quickly took over the regency and brutally purged all of his opponents. And by brutally, I mean tying a rebellious general's mother to a battering ram kind of brutal. When he gained control of his nephew, he first made him sign his own mother's death warrant and then ordered his men to strangle 14-year-old Alexios, tied weights to his body and threw him in the Bosphorus. A couple of years later, when a pretender claiming to be Alexios appeared in the Balkans, Andronicus said, well, he must have been a really good swimmer. You can just imagine a taunt like this coming out of Daemon's mouth. Andronicus' downfall was truly Macbethian. Himself believing in the Aemon prophecy, the now Emperor Andronicus was worried about everyone whose name started with the letter Iota. He sent his henchmen to murder an army officer, Isaac Angelos, but Isaac escaped the attempt and stoked the people of the capital in a revolt against the tyranny of Andronicus. By this time, the populace already saw the villain's true face, and no amount of charisma was going to save him. Three years ago, everyone cheered when Andronicus returned to the capital, seemingly to restore order to the troubled regency. Now the same people were cheering as the still-alive Andronicus was being publicly dismembered in the Hippodrome. 
I hope I have now convinced you that the story in House of the Dragon is uncannily similar to that of the Byzantine Emperor Manuel. Now I'm going to give some of my thoughts on the legacies of both Manuel and King Viserys. But first let me give you a warning. To assess the legacy of King Viserys, I had to read ahead to the events not yet covered in the first season of the show. I'm not going to spoil anything that isn't obvious in my opinion, but if you want to avoid any hint of the future events in the House of the Dragon, you should stop the video right here. So spoiler alert, a lot of people die. I know it might be a big disappointment to those of you who thought that the Green and the Black faction could just hug it out and go back to living in the same castle, but there it is. Hope for a stable succession was shattered almost as soon as Viserys drew his dying breath, and his progeny started killing each other mere days after the funeral. A massive civil war called the Dance of the Dragons later claimed the lives of many of them, the opposite of what Viserys wished. I began making this video thinking that Andronicus and Daemon were the biggest similarity between the two stories. But the more I studied the Byzantine politics of the 12th century, the more I came to the conclusion that it is Viserys and Manuel who are the most similar. And it is not about visual likeness, scandalous relationship or a superstitious belief, but about the way they handled the situation and the consequences for everyone around them. Manuel and Viserys have the same crucial flaw. They are non-committal. Manuel had a lot of good diplomatic initiatives throughout his reign, be it his Hungarian play, his alliance with the Kingdom of Jerusalem or Italian city-states, or even his Anatolian campaign. Each one of these could have succeeded with more preparation or more commitment put into it. However, all of them were half-hearted and were abandoned before being taken to the logical conclusion. This constant flip-flopping eroded the trust that existed between the Byzantines and their Catholic allies in the beginning of Manuel's reign. He tried to make everyone into an ally, but instead made no allies at all. 24 years after Manuel's death, the Latin Crusaders sacked Constantinople, and the Emperor's prophetic dream became reality. Same accusation can be lobbed towards King Viserys. He talks a great deal about how everyone should just get along, but doesn't put enough effort and commitment into making it happen. What's worse, when confronted with a decision between two sides of his family, he refuses to make one and runs from it. This contributes to the mutual mistrust between the family members, as no conflict is ever resolved and no closure or clarity is provided. He is way too lenient towards Daemon, same as Manuel is too lenient towards Antronicus. He does not disinherit Rhaenyra when her infidelity becomes obvious, but neither does he reassert her claim. More than two decades have passed since the lords were sworn to support Rhaenyra. Since then, Many of them have died, but none of their successors, neither the king's sons, Aegon and Aemond, were made to pledge their fealty to her. This created an unstable situation that only took an accident to devolve into a brutal civil war. The indecision in diplomacy and excessive leniency towards their relatives by both the Byzantine and Westerosi leader are what makes the future strife for their realms inevitable. That is how the fictional and the real story are most similar in my opinion. Despite all of the power-hungry nobles and conniving foreign entities that surround them, the well-meaning Viserys and Manuel should be the first to blame for the disasters that followed their reigns. I hope you liked my take on the historical influence behind HBO's show. Tell me in the comments whether you think it is intentional or coincidental. Thanks a lot for watching, and I will see you in the next one.